So someone can experience anxiety their whole life and never have a panic attack. And someone can have a panic attack and not really feel a lot of anxiety. But typically, most people who have panic attacks will have a pretty high baseline of anxiety. Um, anxiety is an overall general sense of dread, right? Feeling like something bad is going to happen, something bad is happening, and it affects you psychologically and sometimes physically. A panic attack is a full onslaught of a suite of symptoms that for many people is completely debilitating. Hey everybody, welcome back to Heal Squad with Maria Menounos and as well you can easily surmise uh, it's not Maria Menounos, it's Mr. Maria Menounos sitting in for my beautiful and talented wife once again and bringing you part two of our interview with Matt Gutman. Matt's the author of the book, No Time to Panic. He's also an ABC News uh, chief national news correspondent. Knows a thing or two about uh, um, anxiety, panic attacks, and disorders of that nature. He went really deep on the subject. He'd been suffering from them his whole life. And uh, we just got some fabulous takeaway in part one. And again, uh, even more takeaway in this particular episode. So have your notebooks ready. Be taking those notes. And uh, without any further ado, my interview with uh, Matt Gutman, author of the book, No Time to Panic. And yet, still, that kind of anxiety is normal. And just learning that it was normal and being like told that I'm okay and not, you know, a total broken basket case was a huge relief for me. Um, and then I decided to try to do something about it. So um, I don't know, have you guys done uh, holotropic breath work on the show? We've done we breath work, that, but I never heard of it. breath work. Hol yeah, but holotropic? I've yeah, never like heard that. Can, you, can, can you... we get into that a little bit? Sure. T tell me about uh, it. So the first, one of the first things I did is uh, there's a buddy of mine from high school um, who was a great athlete in high school, and he and I were we played football together in lacrosse, and um, he is now uh, a meditation teacher and yoga teacher and breath work teacher. And um, his name is Lane Jaffe. He's in LA, by the way. Okay. And uh, he does this this hardcore um, breath work. And it's kind of a mixture of things. But basically, you go into this room, a bunch of strangers for me, and you lie down and you start to breathe. And he sort of is like uh, a coach, basically, telling you how to breathe, a, a coxswain on, on, a, on a crew boat, right? So it's two breaths in, one breath out through the mouth. So, and you want to really breathe through your through your belly and then belly and then chest and then out. And the if you do it fast, you keep doing that for a while, you're going to get lightheaded. And you do it a little bit longer than that, you're going to get more than lightheaded. What you're going to do is flood your body with so much oxygen that and deprive it of carbon dioxide that your body's gonna be unable to actually break down the oxygen. So in a way, you're kind of depriving yourself of oxygen. It's it's kind of an inverse thing. What ends up happening is that for me, uh, and a lot of people, you'll end up having lobster claws because your blood that's rich with oxygen is gonna go to your core, to your body, uh, your heart, your vital organs. Um, and out of the places that it normally is in. So your hands curl up, your feet curl up, and you basically have what I had was, a, you know, a, a psychedelic experience, not like a full-blown thing. But the first time I did it with Lane, I just started sobbing. I started crying hysterically. And it was like cathartic and a little weird and a little scary. And I'm in a room full of strangers and I'm like, <laughs> Oh. just totally weeping and lane comes and he grounds me uh which in in therapy talk and in psychedelic talk is basically like making you feel that somebody is there with you without taking you out of it so just being like putting a hand on your arm or he did it on my legs i'm here you're good i, I love okay. that i'm there with you without taking you out of it yeah. A lot of times, like we I mean, run, we rush in like firemen and firewomen and just try to, and that's not what to do. I'm there with you. Without give someone a box of tissues. We so quickly try yes. to quench the 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 tears and 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 put it out. Oh, don't cry, don't cry. And and you know, for Lane and basically a lot of the people in the healing world, 
Crying is the best medicine. It's free. It releases all these wonderful feel-good chemicals in your body. Um, you know, crying from sadness or, or happiness, but not from pain, uh, is like is great medicine. And that's one of the themes in the book is that eventually all these modalities that I tried turned into grief therapy sessions. Uh, lots of crying, lots of tears. Um, and then I basically also simultaneously at the same time, I started trying every sort of thing in the pharmacological book. Like I thought, I was sure that in my psychiatrist's magical prescription pad, there was going to be the solution. It was there, we just had to try. And so I did um, SSRIs for many years. Uh, and then I tried something different with him. I did benzos, which is like Xanax. Mm -hmm. Um but but did it deplete did it uh did any of those deprive you of your skill as a reporter and your sharpness so doing benzos made me too sleepy and i felt like i wasn't me right i tried propranolol which is a beta blocker which basically reduces your body's ability to feel that basically it, it keeps your heart rate at a certain rate so you don't feel the physical symptoms of a panic attack and it made me feel super sluggish and not me either. And you know what's so funny? I, I, you know what I've said to Maria when I've tried those things? I just said, it, Maria, I don't know how to explain this, but it took the me out of me. Totally. And so now, yeah. you know, Maria doesn't want me taking, she doesn't even like me taking Dramamine because I just turned into a zombie. And That's funny. Yeah, it takes the it takes the you out of you, at least for us and anyway, also, our body makeup. So, I'm, you know, I want to be clear. Right, it, but it, more than that, like for me, like, if I'm going live every day, I don't want to be on Xanax every single day of my life. I don't have to take propranolol every day. You can't work out afterwards. Like that's not the solution. Even if it really was 100% successful for me, and it wasn't. Um, I tried Prazosin, which is um, an anti-seizure medication. I did every ADHD medication. <laughs> I literally tried everything. Yeah, but you were the guinea pig, which is great. Which is again, no time to panic because of the book. You know what you've you've been through. So continue though. Matt, please. And so basically at this point, I I, uh, I realized that I'm not broken. I realized that all these drugs are not working for me. Maybe I'll try some alt alternative medicine because the, the intense breath work was working for me. Um, and it's at this point that I also started trying to find panic attack support groups. And there were so few, Kev, in the whole mm. country. Like yeah. I just wanted to talk I've to never people heard of about- one. I've never heard of one. Right. There were, at the time, there were five- but three had folded, three had folded because of COVID. So there was one um, that was like open to people around the country. It technically met in Brooklyn, but they opened it up to Zoom. And then there were people from like Washington State, from Illinois, um, Texas, Arizona, me, California, Massachusetts, everywhere. And just to get through the intros, there were so many people, it took like 40 minutes. Um, so I joined this group and then we set up an offshoot group on a WhatsApp chain and uh, I'm still in it. Um, and I talked to the, to the folks there and uh, it's just, it was nice to be able to talk to people. And when I realized that there were so few groups and so few people who were actually talking about this openly, that's the point that I realized I can help people here. Maybe I'm going to write a book. Maybe I can do something here. And that was about a year, a year and a half into the process. Um, it's also the point that I learned that about anywhere from 25 to 50 percent of the American population is at some point in their lives going to experience a panic attack. So it's extremely common, despite the fact that we don't talk about it, um, obviously massively common in ERs. And that's where the genesis for the book came. Um, I was still on this road. And then we can talk about like the psychedelic experiences uh in a sec, but like, that's what got me started on this book. Hang on, you know, I panic. I want to talk to people. How come there's no panic attack support groups? There's a support group for every other thing you want in the world. And I called the um, AADA. Uh, I called uh, basically all these anxiety and depression groups in America, and nobody really had an answer. So for me, this book was an attempt to provide an answer to the millions, tens and tens of millions of Americans who experience panic. Some gonna give some every day, some once in a lifetime, but almost everybody in the country has either had a panic attack or has a family member who's experienced one. I think that almost all of us have, because now that you have me thinking, 
and I'm thinking mm-hmm. of different things that I'm I'm even embarrassed. I can't even say on air, but that you'd probably laugh and be Kev, what's the big deal? But I realize now, as you're saying, that we're more than likely panic attacks. Uh, and I just probably sorry, just, yeah, and I probably just was like, well, well you know, suck it up, dude. But knowing that it's made Especially so many other men, issues. Kev. Yes. This is the problem with men. Right. Like for years, I was like, suck it up, dude, never happened. That's just nerves. I'm good. That's just nerves. Yeah. Right. That's our thing. Yes. But yeah. I wasn't good. No, the wheels come off the wagon, as I learned, you know, with health issues. And, and when I uh, started going into my physical health issues and exploring the, mm-hmm. uh, exploring the emotional component, we came to realize it was all those other things of suck it up, suck it up, suck it up, play through, play through, play through, be a man, tough it through. And then, you know, again, my body just is, had been and disintegrating, you know, and so... Mm. Um, with awareness, though, as what you're showing us too, is with awareness, you're halfway there. So once you became aware of this, I feel like you were halfway toward fixing it. But I think a lot of us don't even realize that we have panic attacks. And I actually think, but you know, Matt, I think that uh, I know a lot of people who, again, I'll bring it back to women. I know a lot of women who don't have panic attacks, but you know why? They literally don't put themselves in any position to panic. So now they literally take themselves out of any challenges or things that would help them grow, ascend, fill their cup. And uh, and so I think that that's been their way of coping, which is not, you know, which is not healthy either. I think men too, Kev. You know, yeah. one of the reasons my agent was so enthusiastic about this is because he experiences the same thing uh, or had experienced the same thing on like company calls or company Zoom or company meetings. And he would just like, he really suffered from it. Yeah. And so he self avoiding it. And there's a, there's a term for it. It's called avoidance behavior. And it's really debilitating as you just noted. And that's how people end up becoming agoraphobic. That's why agoraphobia is so closely associated with panic because panic is so painful. It's so scary when it happens that you don't want to ever experience it again. And you are willing to pretty much do anything to avoid right. experiencing so you become that agoraphobic. kind of, You just take yourself out of society. That's the safest place. Like I'm locked in my house. What is behavior? Right. And nothing can, I can control this domain. I can't control the outside. And I totally get it. I totally get where those people are. And by from. the way, other, you know, another form of avoidance behavior, sometimes when people just become nasty because uh. they keep everyone... You know, mm. it's control. It, 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 so they have to have massive control. They're really nasty and mean to everyone else around them. Everyone is just kind of walking on eggshells around them. But to, I, I know because I'm thinking of bosses you and I probably know um, <laughs> and having empathy for them. But having empathy when I could see the little bit of humanity inside them, this is probably they were just scared and full of anxiety and panic themselves. Um Interesting. I don't, I mean, listen, I don't know, like, it's interesting. I don't know if, if keeping people at bay is a manifestation of panic. It probably is anxiety. A lot of people express anxiety right. as defensive or, or fear. Um, but the panic thing, maybe, I mean, I don't know. So I wait, do so, know so that would you say, clinically, so can we define, clinically it's associated with agoraphobia. Okay. Can we and define anxiety versus panic these, though? Or do we need to define, sorry? do we need to define anxiety versus panic? Yeah. Can there's you, a difference. Can you do that? Yeah. So someone can experience anxiety their whole life and never have a panic attack. And someone can have a panic attack and not really feel a lot of anxiety. But typically most people who have panic attacks will have a pretty high baseline of anxiety. Um, anxiety is a g- overall general sense of dread, right? Feeling like something bad is going to happen. Something bad is happening and it affects you psychologically and sometimes physically. A panic attack is a full onslaught of a suite of symptoms that for many people is completely debilitating, right? This is your brain. That's not telling you that there is a chronic scary thing that you need to avoid. It's telling you you're pulling the panic alarm. The, the fire alarm, and you need to make something change right now because you are your life is imperiled. You are in massive danger right now, and you need to pay attention. And that's why it raises your heart rate because it thinks you're about to be attacked by a wild animal. And by the way, all of this stuff is evolutionary, right? Your body's preparing for an attack by a wild animal or some sort of assault. Your heart rate goes up so you can pump more blood into your extremities so you can run faster. 
you get a surge of adrenaline to keep that going. Cortisol then follows through to keep you able to run away. Your pupils dilate because when were humans most attacked or most vulnerable to, let's say, animal attack? At night. So we opened up our pupils real big so we could collect light, so we could see the jaguar or lion or whatever is jumping at us from the tree. Um, you sweat to become more slippery. The adrenaline has an anal, uh, a pain-killing element, which means that if the lion takes a bite out of your butt, you're going to be able to keep running for a little bit. Um, all this stuff is evolutionary, and it makes sense. It's not incredibly useful for our day-to-day -day lives right now, but knowing why it is that way and why humans are uh, and why humans have this response to panic is actually kind of helpful because then you know, okay, well, at least I know why it's happening. It doesn't help me today, but it does make sense. Um, and yeah, a lot of people suffer it. So in order, so I, I had gotten to the point where I knew I wasn't broken. I knew that I was okay and it was normal, but I still needed to find the fix. And I tried all the stuff in pharmacology and it wasn't really working. And then I decided to try the alternative medicines. Um, so the first thing I tried was psilocybin mushrooms. Oh, and I had a pretty a, a powerful experience. Um, at first, it, I, I had anticipated that it would just be grief. That I had this like well, I called it a well of sadness, a well of grief. And my fear all along, really through after high school and into adulthood, is that I had all this grief I was carrying. And if I actually sank or fell into that well of grief, I would never be able to crawl or, or climb my way out. And I was afraid of falling in. So I did not experience grief. I did not allow myself really to grieve. And I'd expected in that first mushroom journey, which was with a, a guide who was sitting right next to me the whole time, um, a, a, a psychiatric nurse, as it were. Um, and it, instead of like feeling this, this sadness, I felt this strength. I was like, I imagined or I saw myself inside Yosemite, like inside the granite of the mountain, looking through the skin of a mountain. And like, I saw the solidity of oaks and like strong fungi. I don't know why, it makes sense. Uh, anyway, so like these, these images of solidity and I was like, oh, that's cool. I didn't expect that. Um, I did ayahuasca. But can we back up I on the mushroom Mexico. thing? Because I wanted to get to the ayahuasca too. So... I wonder why you saw strength and it wasn't the sadness. Did did the your shaman or whoever your guide help you with that? You don't you don't know. No, the medicine you get what you need is what they say. You get what you, know, you the need. The medicine takes you to where you need to go. And maybe I needed like maybe I was so broken down that I needed to feel a little like bit you were strong rather than yeah more sad. Because I see someone. I'm seeing someone very strong. I mean that's what I see from the outside. Um, that's very interesting. I, I do want to like caution people about the mushroom thing. Like you had someone with you cause I know the ayahuasca and the, you know, I don't, I've never done it, but I know that people who've done it and had successes, they, they say you, you have to have someone with you that is, a, um, a train guide or, you know, has the senses. So, so you went through that. Did it help you the mushrooms before we get on ayahuasca? Do you think it helped? It totally helped. And I'm so glad that you raised that. Yes, every single thing that I did for this book was with a professional guide. Good. Okay. None of this, and I don't think anybody the first time, if they're trying, I mean, if you're doing it recreationally, you want to have a good time, I'm not going to judge anyone. That's fine. But if you want to do it for psychiatric and psychological benefits, it's best to do it with a professional guide or someone who's with you who knows what they're doing and who can take care of you if something goes wrong. Right. Um, so it's a really important point you raised. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ayahuasca. It was really helpful. But, yeah. Like I immediately felt the benefits. That, that's of the mushrooms. Less fear. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then you did ayahuasca. Right. So just for someone who doesn't know ayahuasca, can you tell, can you describe that your experience of what? Ayahuasca is a blend of two Amazonian vines. Um, one gives you the psychedelic experience and one breaks down the other in your body so that you can actually have the psychedelic experience. Unfortunately, it's not the most pleasant thing. Uh, it's this nasty brew that is like boiled down and boiled down and boiled down. And it's this sludgy, like Mississippi mud type of stuff. Have you ever done it by the way? No, no, I want, I okay. keep saying I want to, but I haven't. It's vile. So I was in Peru and uh, I was doing it with a group of people 
and you drink a cup of this stuff and you immediately are like, mm, it really is nasty. Uh, and you're doing it in a room and there, where we did it, there were two shamans and they start singing these ancient Shipibo, which is a, a, an Amazonian tribe songs. And they're just like riffing on these songs. And it's very trippy and very um, mystical and cool and cool. I mean, just, it takes you away. They're singing. But I didn't really feel it after the first cup. And there are some people who've literally just sailed off to Jupiter and are experiencing deity and God. Literally, you know, one guy's like, I had, uh, I experienced God. I had intergalactic, intergalactic soul sex with my wife, visited love upon my son, brought healing to all of humanity. And I'm like sitting there on the mat on the floor being like, what the, what, yeah. what's happening? So I feel ill. So then I go up and I take another cup and they're like, okay. Ooh. And I go back and I still don't feel anything. Oh, so no. that's the first night. The second night I take twice as much as the night before. And I still don't really have an experience. It's nice. And I'm like really in the moment and I feel something, but this is not the psychedelic experience of great healing, which ayahuasca is known for. By the way, ayahuasca is known is not pleasant, but really good medicine. Some people have these incredible visions that are life-changing. And a lot of people have some, you know, pretty painful experiences, but they're really healing and they're good for you. And then the I know some people it's session, done nothing for anyone. I, I've know I've seen the heard the whole thing. Yeah. Right. So tell us about the third session. So the third session, I take five times the dose of other people. Five times. And what ends up happening is that it just tears my stomach apart. No, the other end. Oh no, the big the other, D the coming whole, out. The oh. other end, and it lasted for 10 days. I was so sick. I was there for a week. Oh. I was so sick. And I did actually start to have a psychedelic experience five hours into it. And the shamans look at me and they're like, oh my God, this this guy, what are we going to do with him? And you know, What was their conclusion it, it just, as to why with you? There are a couple of things. Some people, as you just noted, are essentially they have two A receptors, which are serotonin receptors in, in your brain that don't that are different and just don't pick up on the, the psychoactive drug in ayahuasca. Um, I had gotten off the SSRI that I was on two months earlier. I was completely off of it for two full months, which should have been enough. Maybe that's another reason. I don't know. Um, but listen, I, I I derived a great benefit from it. For okay. me, it was it was being with this like this brotherhood of people that I got to know during this week long retreat, um, I, I I received wisdom and, and joy from the shamans, and I felt to some degree healed when I left there. But I also did something called five meo DMT, which is uh, the sin, the venom of a Sonoran desert toad. Oh yeah, you poison frogs, right? The toxic. Yeah, I read that. Yeah, <laughs> I read that. So this book. is it's it's just what people know as DMT. It's not exact. It's five meo DMT. It's a certain order, desert toad, and in this one, sorry, it's yeah, it it seems like I did a lot, but it was it was an interesting experience. So this one, is you're this sucking. You, this, you, go ahead, suck it. Yeah, tell me. This beaker tube full of smoke through a rubber straw. This is also in Peru, and you breathe it in. And of course, this is all being facilitated by professionals. You breathe it in and like it, you're gone. You've like <laughs> been catapulted. It, it's instantaneous. Oh my God. And I snapped out of it really quickly. And suddenly I found myself sweating on the floor and I'm screaming in catharsis. And I ended up screaming for like 35 minutes straight, just like, ah, ah. Um, and it was, I had, listen, it was really weird and I felt badly for my fellow uh, retreat mates who were there, who were just trying to go off into space and their DMT experience and I'm screaming, but it was like something needed to come out of me. And I afforded myself the opportunity there to give no about yeah. anything and just yeah. let it out. I just didn't care. So it was good. And I let it out and I let it out and I let it out and a facilitator was holding me and they're like, are you okay? I'm like, I am okay. I just need to do this. And I just kept screaming and and then it was over. And I felt like I had removed a thousand pounds of grief. It was the most incredible experience. And then these other guys who were in this retreat with me, we all piled on each other in this massive like group hug. 
they were like, oh, man. there was just like a lot of hugging and tears. And it was like joy and sadness and snot and a lot of man in the circle. And it, it was just like, it was beautiful is what I needed. Um, so, you know, these experiences ended up chipping away at the panic slowly, but surely and chipping away at this grief by also giving me an avenue to cry. And that was what I realized. Like I, I think of myself as open and maybe I am, um, but there's also the physical manifestation of grief that we have to excavate. And especially men, sometimes we have a hard time doing it. We do. So for me, all that stuff was, was super, super important. Hey, Heal Squad. If you are somebody who doesn't have the time or you don't think you have the talent to, to dress yourself or style yourself, um, or you're just looking to make a, a change in your wardrobe or an upgrade, Macy's has this amazing thing where they have personal stylists that you can actually go online and secure a time with. And what will happen is uh, you go into the store, you're allotted time, and one of their personal stylists will actually take you through the store. You tell them what your budget is. You tell them what you want to do. If it's, I want something for a date night, I want something for the office, I have a wedding coming up. They'll actually take you through the store, do the work for you, and curate the items for you within your budget, which I think is just incredible. And they do this for free for any of you who want to see some of Maria's items. Maria has a curated list of some of the outfits she loves and that she's purchased. If you want to see that, go to Macy's.com backslash Heel Squad to check it out. There's more. There are more psychedelic experiences. No, but I, I know. I but, um, you know, I, I just, I feel like my, I don't know. My regular guy take is you are such an intense overachiever that I think that's why the modalities had that kind of effect on you. My sense, my sense is your energy and your strength. I'm, you know, I'm looking, by the way, just if you're listening in audio, this is the Tom Cruise of, uh, of reporters. <laughs> he reminds me of Tom <laughs> Cruise. Um, so I kind of think there's something to that. Okay. So let's go past. So now we're past the psychedelic. So then you know, when do we start getting to the um, crying with strangers and the bear hugging your fears and all the other things that start coming? Well, that was all that stuff was basically on those trips. I also tried ketamine, which is amazing. And I experienced ego death. And basically, wait, wait, wait. No, I stop, Matt. You can't just say ego death. That's a big one. That's a big pipe bomb. Tell me about ego okay. death, because I know what how bad ego is, affects men, uh, especially. Okay. So ketamine is the most commonly administered sedative or anesthetic in the world. Um, it's not used in so much in the US anymore as much as in developing countries and, and other places. Um, it's a very common um, pediatric anesthetic. And the reason for that is it takes you pretty deep, pretty fast, and for a short duration, about half an hour, an hour, depending on the dose. And so I did it with a psychiatrist who administered the medicine and a psychologist who was sitting next to him. I had like an audience of two dudes uh, looking at me as I went through this psychedelic experience. Um, and basically like they gave me this shot and it wasn't a huge, huge dose. It was a strong dose. Um, and the doctor basically wanted me to be on the teetering edge of consciousness slash being completely out, right? Like if you get enough ketamine, they, they do surgery around you. Like they could cut off your arm and you won't feel it cause you are gone. There's nobody home anywhere. Right. But if they give you less than that, it's enough that you're not going to be in your right mind, but you'll still sort of have some sort of like some baseline awareness. And so they gave me the shot at first. It's like really nice because it feels like you're drinking. Finally, I want to, yeah. I want, can some of these drugs feel good? Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, so okay. they, for some people, they feel massively wonderful, but you know, that wasn't my experience everywhere, but everybody experiences them differently. Okay. But this one is really good. So it was like having cocoa on like a cold winter's day, you know, I was like, oh, oh, that's good. You know, it's kind of like when you go to, uh, if there's anybody over 50 or ever 45, if you've had a colonoscopy and you get propofol, it's the first few seconds of that. Uh, I haven't had my first colonoscopy, but I've heard a lot about it. You know, it is. It's amazing. It's magic. <laughs> those, just, those, <laughs> just those few seconds. You're like, oh, and That's then you're gone. Heard. Like, please. And oh. then it's the best sleep you've ever had. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the colonoscopy's next. That's our next episode, Kev. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, so you get the shot, you start feeling amazing, and then you sink lower and lower and lower. And like, 
I experienced the universe as this giant map, like old school maps, you know, that used to fold up. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly the map starts folding up smaller and smaller and then into nothing and then gets put into the glove compartment. And then all I see is this congealed world of colors and then everything turns to black. And pretty soon I realized that there is no Matt Gutman. There is no book project of no time to panic. There is no California where I was doing this in Ojai. There's no United States. There's no planet Earth. There's no universe. There is nothing. I, there's no present. There's no future. There's no past. I don't know who I am. I don't know what an I is. And I'm a speck in a limitless giant void of a universe. There is nothing else there. And I don't know if I'm alive or dead. And I don't know if what an I is, right? Like... And so after a few minutes or an eternity, I couldn't be sure. I sort of come out in this small voice. I'm like, am I alive? And the uh, the psychiatrist who is like six foot four, Dr. Mark Bronstein, six foot four, redheaded dreadlocks dude who wears velour suits. He's like, <laughs> yes. And I'm like, is this reality? He's like, this is full reality, man. <laughs> and uh, and then I was like, okay. And he's like, go, keep going, go deeper. And then like, I have this incredible experience and I, I communed with my wife who'd also had ketamine when she had her cesarean when we lived here in Jerusalem in 2008 and our, first, and our daughter Libby was born and she had an emergency C-section and they gave her ketamine and she was in the K-hole, the dreaded K-hole, which was I where I was. Um, and it really threw her. She had a terrible experience and it really propelled her into that postpartum depression. And I started crying because I now understood her better. I understood the pain that she had suffered. And she wasn't able to have that experience of ketamine while having two professional psychologists, psychiatrists right there by her side to protect her. And eventually I had those guys like actually hold me because I felt like I needed to be grounded. And like, you know, like I had all these benefits and my wife didn't. And it really helped me communicate with her in this subconscious way and connect with her in a way that I would, in terms of empathy, that even though I was empathetic, I, I'd never really been able to do. It was just a super powerful experience. And I did two more of those sessions with them. And like, I felt really good. I felt like at that point I had beat panic. Um, I hadn't quite, but. That's the, that was the next chapter. But yeah, it, it, they were incredibly important for me in order to touch base with a different part of my being, right? Because I couldn't get to where I needed to go in my right mind. I literally had to get out of my mind, out of my right mind in order to find this place where healing existed. And psychedelics was the way to get there for me. Other people can find for you. modalities. Psychedelics really helped me get to those it sounds like hard it. to reach places. So then after the psychedelics, what was the next move? Um, I really focused on cognitive behavioral therapy and um and uh you know I it's a long story, but then yeah, cognitive behavioral therapy. I would like to hear more about it because I think a lot of people are intimidated by the other stuff and they also don't have the access to some of the yeah. psychedelics. Um, so cognitive behavioral therapy is the most commonly used methodology to treat panic attack. And basically it's exposure therapy, but you know, I have a couple of issues with it. So it basic first, it teaches you, um, the psychological, the, 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 the edu psychoeducational approach, which is the stuff you're afraid of or have a phobia over snakes, planes, driving in your car, um, having a panic attack on air, uh, heights, whatever it is, the chances of it actually killing you are infinitesimal. So what is the point in worrying about something you have no control over? Um, on the other hand, I understand people who have those phobias and they have them for specific reasons. And sometimes they make a lot of sense, like flying in an airplane and an enclosed aluminum tube seven miles in the air at 500 miles an hour with germ spewing humans that doesn't sound rational, right? Like that is scary when you start to think about it. Driving is terrifying when you start to think about it because that is the most common way 
that people our age, adults 18 to 50, whatever, are going to get killed. If you're not going to die from disease, car accidents is what's going to kill you. So I understand those fears. But the psychoeducation of cognitive behavioral therapy is there to teach you it's really not likely going to happen. Then it teaches you exposure. You know, uh, I went to the the clinic of Mike Telch in um, the University of Austin, Texas, who's he's sort of one of the, the greatest uh, practitioners of cognitive behavioral therapy. And he put me in like lock boxes where people who have claustrophobia learn how to not be claustrophobic anymore, uh, like coffins when you're like locked like this and he locks the door and it's pitch black in there, um, all sorts of things like that. They have like fake tarantulas. Uh, it's really interesting. And they also give you some uh, 35% uh, carbon dioxide, which is the way that psychologists simulate a panic attack because even though you're getting as much oxygen as you were getting before, you're getting a lot more carbon dioxide and that makes your brain think that you are suffocating. And so I just, I was like totally okay with those physical challenges and the carbon dioxide. Um, and but I did, I did end did, up did, having a panic attack the day after my sessions with Dr. Telch, probably because I'd had too much carbon dioxide, but on a totally random way, I was just interviewing somebody in their house. There had been a murder in this house in Austin. And I did something I'd done a thousand times before opening the door to talk to someone to try to give them, get them to give me an interview about the thing that had happened in their lives. And looking at the guy, I suddenly couldn't talk and I was having a panic attack. And it was the first time in my life that I had a panic attack, just talking to someone like that's my gift is communicating with people. So why after was, all of like, that, was there a tie to the exposure therapy you think that? So there was, and I had ended up embracing it. I was like, you know what? I never had this kind of panic attack, but at the same time, I was able to say, sorry, sir, I'm having a panic attack. Give me a sec, I'm gonna be okay. And I was just standing there, unable to talk. And I then said that, which was part of the therapy. That's what Dr. Telch was telling. He's like, you be open with it. You can tell someone, hey, I'm having a panic attack. I'm gonna be okay. And so like, so I was able to uh, uh, apply the lessons I had just learned, even though I didn't really want to have a panic attack again after all of that. But then instead of thinking like, oh my God, I'm such a effing failure. How did this happen? I turned it around. I was like, you know what? I'm glad I have experienced something I've never experienced before. I'm a collector of experiences. And now I have even more empathy for all those people who I look down upon, frankly, for having panic attacks in social situations, which I didn't do. And now I'm like, you know what? They're right. I now empathize with those people. I can feel them in a different way than I ever could. I'm so grateful for this experience. And that was it. And that was the last panic attack that I had. Wow. Um, and you know what? Does that tie into the ego death? Is what the other modalities that killed you know your what? ego? I never right? thought of that until you mentioned that. Yeah. That's really because I didn't you think admit, about it. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, your ego's gone. So you're not you're not worrying about your ego being bruised. Like, hey, I'm having a panic attack. And also I get why now all these other people have these panic attacks. So maybe yeah. that did uh, yeah, crush your ego to yeah. get yeah, get it out of totally. the equation. I didn't think about that. That's yeah. Uh and so, you know, that's sort of my journey. And I've been working on it since. And I don't do very much psychedelics anymore, although I, I did uh, mushrooms about a month ago, which was fantastic. But that you know, I haven't done anything except for that in a couple of years. Um, but when I meditate and I do various forms of meditation and mindfulness, um, and I don't like I'm not fancy. I'll do five minutes, 10 minutes at a time, half an hour sometimes. But like, I don't need a lot. Once a day? Um, once a day? If I can. If you yeah. can. Okay, if you can. Sometimes right. twice a day, sometimes once a day, sometimes if I don't have time, like you do, I won't do it. Transcendental? What kind do you do? I don't really do it anymore. No, I do a mindfulness technique. Um, I do a couple. One is like a hypnosis thing where I basically count down beads. Um, each breath, there are five beads on a string. It's in my imagination. Mm -hmm. And I just count down each bead. Inhale, exhale down a bead. Inhale slowly, obviously slower. Exhale down a bead. Um, and one of the ways that I try to do it also is closing my eyes and basically recreating the visions that I saw in those psychedelic trips that gave me strength. And so I try to go back to those places 
um, in my mind's eye. And that for me uh, provides a lot of um, benefit. And like preventative. I throw little treasure boxes. Yeah, they're like little treasure boxes. I get to open up and peer at and say, yeah, that was good. Okay. And do you I'm think that back up again? the fact that you haven't had a panic attack, do you think that these these small meditations are part of the reason why? In that they're preventative to having an all of it is and being open about it. And you like now every one of my colleagues knows about this, right? I'd kept it a secret, which on the one hand relieves me of the pressure. On the other hand, it adds because now everybody's like, and I'm gonna go on air shortly. You know, people are like, is he gonna have a panic attack now? How about now? Now? You know, like yeah. people in the beginning really got my they didn't mean to, but they were very curious about it and it increased the pressure a lot and actually so it it caused me last summer to stop drinking because i was so anxious that i basically decided to take manners into it just before the book was published i was like all right i am way too anxious right now what can i do okay i'm going to exercise more and i'm going to cut out drinking entirely right now and i'm going to try to meditate and do mindfulness more and it just, it really helped a lot. Just I think very, it, very, very helpful. Yeah, I think anything mind altering, I know for me at my age, uh, it really affects my emotions now. The come down totally, afterwards, right? the smallest amount, it's just yeah. not worth it anymore. Um, Are you guys dry? Uh, I wouldn't say dry, no. It's just that when I go out, I'll do like a vodka soda and I'll hope that they don't put a lot of vodka in. And if they do, yeah. um, It'll be over the course, and I, I just keep refilling it with club soda, <laughs> to be honest. So it's not that I'm dry. It's just that I know I just can't handle it. The next day, I'm crabby, I'm moody, I'm depressed. Totally. It's just... Totally. Uh, so I think that, yeah, by removing some of these things, you know, even if there's things that we can't add to, to stop these feelings, I know there's things we can remove that exacerbate them. hundred A hundred percent. And alcohol, I find, is, and again, like, yeah, I have had drinks since the summer, and I've like, I have, but not often. And uh, it just helps me be less anxious. Yeah. Yeah. And be sharper. Um, More sharp. You talk about your, you know, you, you talk about a support network in the book and building one because I, I, I find that important in my life. Can you talk about building a support network and how you utilize yours? Yeah. So one of the things we did is build like literally a panic attack support network on WhatsApp. And we added all sorts of people um, and I have it on my WhatsApp chain. And so people just chime in whenever they want to talk about something or express um, a fear or an experience with a new, a lot, a lot of people are still on all sorts of medications. Um, they talk about that. But what's ended up happening with this book is that a lot of people become my support network because I'm no longer keeping this deep, dark secret inside. Like I don't have the secret anymore. Everybody knows this thing that I was trying to hide from people for years. And by the way, like I didn't mention this, but I, I, I knew I had panic attacks after a while. And so I would try to pop a Xanax like quietly or like by acting like I'm coughing, you know, and just throw it in there. And, like, you're always around producers, right? You don't want anybody to know, God forbid, I yeah. have a frailty or I'm vulnerable. Yeah, Nobody yeah. can know. No, I know. Um, I would do like calisthenics before or like push-ups before because if you sometimes get your blood going, it, it helps. Uh, I would show up really late for live shots because I hated standing in front of the camera. When it's more time to I think. Just, yeah, you're, getting your, you're in your icing head. Icing the kicker, I called it. Yeah. So I had all these weird tricks, which is avoidance behavior, by the way, since you mentioned it. Uh, and... It wasn't working. And I'm like, the whole time I'm keeping the secret from people who are my friends. And so when I announced the book and when the book came out, uh, people came out of the woodwork, A, telling me that they also experience panic attacks and B, being like, it's okay. it's okay. Don't worry about it. In fact, there was a producer when I was writing the book, and it was a, this was in COVID, and she's, she was 27 at the time, Lizette Rodriguez. And uh, we're driving back from Phoenix because like this was still when – we weren't taking a lot of planes. And uh, I'm like, okay, I'm going to tell her my deep, dark secret. She's going to be the first producer I tell. I, and I gin up the strength and the the uh, the courage to do it. I'm like, okay, Lizette, 
um, I have panic attacks. I have like, I've had hundreds and hundreds of them on air. Yeah, I have panic attacks. She's like, oh, oh, okay. I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. I, I wanted her to be, you know, distraught and, and empathetic. And, and I'm like, no, 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 on air. Like I've had hundreds of them, huh? And she's like, oh, okay. You know, my sister has them too. Can I ask how old she and is? How old is what? she? How old is she? 27. There you go. So I just feel like that's between being a female and being at that age. She's like, I get it. Whereas the old guard. Big, exactly. What do you mean? What do you mean? Uh, I can't work with this guy. To, so, wow. God, right. God bless everyone in that equation. Exactly. Yes. And so like, the, she's like, yeah, the young generation, we talk about this yes. stuff. My sister's open about it. I, you know, everybody's got this stuff. I was so blown away. I'm like, I've been keeping the secret for 20 years and everybody has it and everybody's talking about it. And I've been keeping this shut inside myself. What is going on? And then, so I just started, you know, revealing it here and there to my boss and, you know, people I expected to shut me out of their lives or cut me off or my work embraced it and embraced me. And they were super supportive and I didn't expect it. And uh, I felt a little silly doing it but i'm i'm glad that you know i don't have to keep that secret anymore. no God. and i know that there are yeah. millions of people who do and i don't judge them if they do keep it a secret but i think that you'll find that people don't judge you as much as you think they, they don't, don't. and i think the ones that do just empathy for them and and maybe they're not meant to be in your life uh and that's the universe you know showing you that door you know talking about one of the things mm -hmm. that makes me really sad about our business matt is how many people um, in Hollywood get cancer, for example, or mm. a life-threatening illness or, or a debilitating illness, and they are afraid to talk about it because they don't think they'll ever work again. And yeah. then, you know, a Pee Wee Herman, a Norm MacDonald, mm. it, um, and the list goes on and on. And I feel sad because they end up perishing anyway but they've blocked themselves off from all the love and the empathy mm -hmm. that they could have received because of that fear, you know, but I understand the fear, but it makes me really sad. And I'm so glad that you opened up and we're able to you, and not hold this in. And I just encourage more people to do it. I know it's scary. I love the idea of the WhatsApp or a text chain of like-minded yeah. people being like, I'm about to go into this meeting guys. I'm freaking out. It's, I Great love job. that. I think that that's a, that's a go-to um, but yeah, there's, um, there's, you're, you're really onto something here. And I know our younger staff members on this show are all going to rush me after this interview because, uh, um, I know everything you said really speaks to them. And, um, mm. the book, no time to panic from Matt Gutman, um, ABC news <laughs> chief national correspondent, which is, I still find so ironic and so amazing. Um, and Matt, now you're off to literally go cover one of the biggest you know, wars going on in the world you know, right now. Yeah. And and I still have that little itch of a fear, you know, that I'm I'm gonna go live. And now that I've been talking about panic for the past, you know, almost hour and a half with you, Kev, I'm like, oh man, is it gonna happen tonight? Is tonight gonna be no, the night? No, 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 no. Right. No, but because again, you, it's like you, me expressing vulnerability. Yeah. It's okay. So okay. You just helped so many people, Matt, and as this this thing lives on on YouTube and it's going to, you know, if it changes one life, but it's going to change many. I also think the other thing, what was interesting was the last panic attack when you admitted, um, when you admitted to the producer uh, that you were having it, it wasn't just a matter of what I found very powerful and I think very helpful. It wasn't just you saying, oh my God, I'm having a panic attack because my earpiece is falling out. Um, it was... I'm having a panic attack, I believe. And you said, and I'm going to be okay. I just need, right? And I think yeah. if you can reach down deep in that last part, and I'm going to be okay, I just need a minute. Now the other person's not, they're not going to go into a panic themselves. Oh my God, what do I do? What exactly. do I do? So just give me exactly. some time. And that, I, so I think that was a, that's also important in this kind of formula for navigating this. And I'm going to totally. be okay. Really I just need a point. minute, you right? And that's a great point because people often ask me, okay, well, I don't experience panic, but I know someone who does, or what do I do if someone's having one near me? You just give them a moment. I mean, for most people, it's probably going to pass pretty quickly. Well, like we said, um, right? Then, right? You know, within, sorry? Go ahead. No, no. Like we said earlier in the, in the interview, uh, it's about providing that safe space. Exactly. You know? 
But continue. I didn't mean yeah. to cut you off, uh, especially at the no, end. No, and of you know, like for me, within probably thirty-five seconds, I was able to keep asking the guy, like, "Hey, you had a murder in your house. Can we go talk to you and and check out the house?" I mean, it, it's bonkers the kind of things we ask for. But yeah, I was like able to sort of compose myself and then just be part of the conversation with this poor man at the door. Um, but yeah, it's the thing is when it's happening to you, it feels like you're dying. It feels like the end of the world, but it's over so quickly and we really, it cannot kill you. So a lot of people think I'm going to die from this, but I assure you, if you're listening and you haven't had one or you have had one and you think you're going to die, it cannot kill you. It's just part of the way humans are engineered. It's going to be okay. So Matt, so, so much of what we went over was preventative and long-term, which I love. Mm -hmm. So and I just, before I let you go, okay, let, I'm in the, let's say I'm in the middle of one. Do you have anything, whether it's, I don't know, whistling, <laughs> humming, like it, what if someone's in it? Now it's, okay. it's, it's too late. We're in it. We're, we're, we're sweating. Yeah. We're huffing, puffing. We're in it. Excellent question. So let's do short term, right? Like you kind of feel something coming on. Don't drink caffeine. Do not add caffeine to your diet. If you feel highly anxious at that time, it's going to send you over the edge. So limit the caffeine as much as you can if you're in an anxious state. Um, obviously, don't drink. If you can, take a five-minute walk. A five-minute walk will increase your levels of serotonin. Um, if you want to take a half an hour run, you'll get some dopamine. Um, you'll get some sun, some vitamin D, which immediately makes you feel better if, you, if it is sunny outside. But even five minutes of a walk will help. Um, any sort of exercise is great. If you're... So those are like my go-to things. I, I I try not to drink too much caffeine before going on air. And if I'm in an elevated state of anxiety, I avoid caffeine uh, almost entirely. If you're having a panic attack, the thing I like to do best is it's, it's a mindfulness technique. And what you're going to want to do is first think of five things that are in your field of view that you see, right? So I see the light in front of me. I see the, I'm um, in a hotel, so there's the beauty and health lounge placard. I see the color blue. I see the black of my eyeglasses case. There's the brown of the table, uh, the red of the tea bag in front of me. Then you think four things that you can hear. So you start analyzing the sounds around you. Then three things that you feel. Okay, I, I feel my butt on this chair. Uh, I feel my jeans on my legs and my watch on my hand. Two things that you smell, one thing that you taste. And if you get to the, those, you know, five, four, three, two, one sensations, you will probably be out of the panic attack um, because your mind is not great at doing two things at once. So you're doing this mindfulness technique by basically tricking your mind to get off the topic of the panic, which is going to reframe what you're doing. Uh, it may take a minute. Maybe you can do it in less, but it's a super, super helpful technique. Um, there's also something you can do with a pen. Uh, I can't find, here's a pencil. Sorry. So uh, it's a little bit of a Jedi mind trick. You focus on the pencil and then you focus on the thing beyond it. I'm looking at your face right now in the screen and now I'm going back to the pencil, your face, the screen, and it activates the vagus nerve, which calms you. Um, it's a little weird to do looking at the pencil thing in public. So I, I do it, you know, if I'm alone or something, but the mindfulness technique it's like you can do it anywhere you are. Nobody has any idea what you're doing. You can do it in absolute privacy while you're in public. Um, so that's my go-to. Uh, and obviously, longer term, as much exercise as you can, talk about it. Um, if you can, see a shrink. Uh, a psychologist are really helpful. If you can't afford it, uh, most chaplains, rabbis, priests, imams uh, often are free and give free advice. And you just... If you just talk about it and tell people what your greatest fear is about panic or whatever it might be, it's super, super relieving. It's just great therapy. Um, if you need to cry, let yourself cry. Do not automatically reach for the tissues to stop the crying. It's medicine. You're releasing these wonderful hormones of oxytocin and serotonin and other stuff that makes you feel better. So don't stop crying if you feel like you're crying. Um, and... Uh, what else is there? Take care of your body. Kevin, you guys do that. I know you're super conscious about that, but you know, we only have one body. Try to eat right. Uh, and again, 
exercise if you can. It doesn't take a lot, even just movement. five minutes or half yeah. an hour. I never work out for more than 30, 35 minutes at a time, ever. Movement, movement. That's all I need. Wow, Matt Gutman, great. How to end it just even on a bigger way. So appreciate your time, Matt. Please stay in touch with us. And, uh, and yes, I'd love to follow up with Maria with this very important subject. And I have a funny feeling. My psychic intuition says this is just the beginning for you. I think you're going to go deeper into mental health um, in your coming projects, uh, and it's all well needed. So good luck out there in the battlefield. Um, uh, keep doing that Thanks great so work for us. Really appreciate it. Matt it. Gutman, appreciate it. no time to panic. That concludes part two of our interview with Matt Gutman. Uh, Duane, uh, did any of this resonate with you as it did with me? It pretty much the whole thing. I was I was glued the entire time. Like there's so many things that he went over that I've experienced myself and want to try like so much. I can't it, too much. It'd be you no. Know, it's all an episode to talk about it. Do do so do Dwayne? Were you experiencing? Have sitting through these the the interview? Do you realize maybe you've had some panic attacks without knowing they were even panic attacks? Oh man, all yeah, so many times where yeah, lots of panic. I think uh, interviewing for this job, I had a panic attack. Yeah, no, I know. I'm <laughs> sorry about that. Well, I think, but you know, um, you're gonna be in these situations, mm -hmm. and it's no risk, no reward, and you know, it's often said you need pain to grow. Unfortunately. So it's either don't get in the batter's box, don't get up to bat at all, and therefore live a less fulfilled life, or find some of the coping mechanisms and tools and modalities that, uh, that Matt discovered in dealing with the panic and the anxiety. So I, felt, I found this to be very helpful, um, and I hope other people do. But in the meantime, uh, I'm gonna, we need to make good choices Seal Squad, everyone. Be nice people, and of course, stay present. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or MariaMenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.